I want to introduce tonight's speakers, Jared and Michael Blau. Jared and Michael are a father and son team who have a passion for history. Both formerly lived in Cornwall, but their professional lives have taken them to other East Coast locations. Distance has not prevented them from staying involved in Lebanon County history, and both have utilized technology and the skills from their professions to continue to unravel history's many mysteries. While tonight's lecture is about education in Lebanon County, they are also deeply interested in Cornwall, the Coleman family, and the local iron industry. So please welcome our speakers, Jared and Michael Blauck. Thank you very much, Mike. We're happy to be back and glad everyone can join us again for part two in the ever-evolving, never-boring study of education in Lebanon County, Pennsylvania. Now, as a reminder, this presentation is part of our Preserving History lectures. So it's one of the many ways we can relay information being preserved from all over the world that we show an interest in. Tonight's content focuses on the Lebanon area schools and the evolution of education throughout the entire county. Our goal is to document facts, keep all information current that's historic, with accurate, relatable, fun facts for all generations thereafter. Our primary focus is on the 20th and 21st centuries of the county and how school buildings began as one purpose, but occasionally benefited the community or individuals in other ways as time progresses. So just as a reminder, for those who didn't catch the first presentation that we gave, <clears throat> Joining us from across the country, please welcome my father, close friend, inspiration for all things historic, Mike Blauk. Dad, if you can hear and see everything okay, feel free to say hello before I continue. Okay, thanks, Jared and Mike. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Today, we're picking up where we left off in part one, as Jared said, and that was last July, about the people, the places, and the things associated with the education in Lebanon County. And Jared and I are very excited to show you the new information that we will be sharing. And we're going to share the presentation duties by tag teaming our way through it tonight. And I'm glad to have you with me here. Couldn't do without you. I'm glad you're joining for this. I am Jared, your host and tour guide of tonight's upcoming paradigm of our post-pandemic paradoxical plethora of pertinent information. reaching the farthest lengths of the globe via the Zoom webinar platform. If we hope if you couldn't join us live tonight that you're watching this on YouTube in years to come. Simply search for the Cornwall Iron Furnace channel, hit subscribe, don't forget that. Click the picture in the circle I highlighted above. And once you click, it brings you to the channel. Under the video section, you'll find the education part one video as the precursor to tonight. Now we can't forget to thank the folks who make all these lectures happen. We thank the Iron Furnace for hosting our content so that we can bring a little bit of history into your home. As always, we do enjoy teaching folks something new, but also learning from as many of you throughout time. Now let's take a look at our general overview. We define the terms that related to education and how those terms affect today's school buildings and districts. We also displayed our ever-evolving list of schools and began our educational timeline which included key people affiliated with the development and naming of buildings used for instructional purposes. As the timeline progressed, we featured some rare photos, sketches, maps, and articles pertaining to the discussed structures. And we'll continue to obviously show you more tonight, but we also emphasize the importance of preserving records in perpetuity to help relocate places, keep information current, clear, and consistent, whichever mysteries may arise. And just as the other lectures, the furnace features, you can interact with us live tonight at the conclusion by asking us questions, making comments, sharing your thoughts and experiences about schools and education you may have thought of since our last lecture. And I'd like to add that uh, the biggest challenge for us tonight is going to be to present a vast amount of information and the detailed content in a relatively short period of time. So Jared, why don't you start this session by providing everyone with the overview of the categories and the topics of the new information that we're going to show them in part two. Well, we discussed the evolution of parochial schools sponsored by and run at the churches and how they dominated the early part of the 1700s, along with 
charity, community, and individual schools, some instructed by a single teacher, usually out of their home. And we brought up how the subscription schools were outvoted by the townspeople because they couldn't afford to send their children away to learn things, therefore paving the way for state governmental school boards mandating public education, which helped lay the framework and divisions for the six school districts we see in our county today. It's pictured here, with Lebanon having the least amount of school districts of all the surrounding counties, I believe. We also defined the facility types and pinpointed the differences between schools, academies, seminaries, business trade, and colleges, providing examples of each type of that structure. We integrated local, state, national, and worldwide events that also occurred during that particular focused timeframe. Now, if we briefly recap the county's educational timeline, we covered a pretty good-sized chunk of information in our first section, touching on the pre-education, including the 18th and 19th centuries, respectively. Working our way to cover the next chapters of our past, present, and future of education here on the right side of the pencil. So, Dad, could you describe the details on a map pertaining to the area we studied? Sure. Uh, for a quick refresher, I'll kick things off by identifying the geographical area that we plan to cover, which, of course, is the location in South Central Pennsylvania. We affectionately know as Lebanon County, as shown on this map. Uh, next, I'd like to add a shaded red outline of Lebanon County to indicate the borders for the purpose of the study tonight. And as we zoom in a little bit further, you can see the state and local routes that border and run directly through the county lines. The major roadway displayed here at the north is Interstate 81, and towards the south is Route 76 or the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And in this next view, as Jared already alluded to earlier, uh, today's scholastic boundary lines are exhibited within the county itself. And presently there are six school districts, which are shown in color, as you can see in this blown up view. And to give you some background as a point of reference, uh, when I first started the research process on this over 40 years ago, I was aware of about 35 schools. And through extensive research that recently has been championed by Jared, that list has grown tenfold. And we now have a total count of schools in Lebanon County alone that exceeds 370. And as remarkable as that may seem, be aware that our list of information about the schools is still growing. Uh, for illustration purposes, Jared's developed a new type of map, which we're going to show here in a second, and that sim simultaneously provides school building locations, and it's done in a chronological order when they were built, revealing all of the schools that existed throughout the history of Lebanon County, including ones that no longer exist, some are repurposed and hidden in plain sight, and others are still in use, plus we're going to show future new school buildings that are currently under construction. And you may notice in this map that we kind of lost the view of the city of Lebanon school district. It's located in the center of the county map and it becomes hidden once we populate the map with all of these schools that are presently found, since the district of the Lebanon city area is also the population's demographic center. So Jared, could you please explain a little bit more some of the details about this uh, unique map that you created and the icons that are exhibited within it. I sure can. Yes, this is by no means complete. We have a lot that we haven't filled in on the western and northern end of this, but what you're seeing is a series of icons which indicate red if the building is no longer standing. Yellow means we aren't really sure of the status or if it's even at that location. And then green means still standing. So as you can see, the majority are still there along with the corresponding public, private, or parochial icons within each of those circle symbols. And next, we're going to show you a current listing of all the schools. And what you see on this page is a list of 60 schools. It's in alphabetical order. And we continue that in the next seven consecutive pages in a row to list all 370 plus schools that we presently found. The ones that are highlighted with an asterisk they lack some information that we need yet to validate their location or the source of it. Uh, since the list is so long, I'm not going to take the time to mention every school, but rather uh, Jared and I highly recommend that you would view this list at your leisure once this presentation is posted on YouTube. 
And by the way, we welcome input from anyone who has more information on these schools or any other ones that we haven't included on our extensive list. I'd like to move forward with the next part of the presentation, the main part of it, so that we can delve into more detail and I'm sure you're interested in. I'll reiterate that the method that we chose to identify these major events, trends in technology and the significant people who had major effect on the education in Lebanon County, it will all be presented using a simple chronological timeline that Jared has constructed. And that's the same format that we introduced and followed in our part one lecture. As we navigate through the centuries, the slides are going to include actual school photos and many other impactful events and interesting facts about the history throughout the county. We hope that you find this information interesting, informative, and a little bit entertaining maybe. Uh, so Jared, would you please begin presenting that chronological timeline that you created starting where we left off in the 1880s? Absolutely. We're gonna jump back in our timeline from the previous show. I did rush a little bit as we concluded our part one. So I omitted a few precursors to the 1900s, which I thought were important to mention. Now, the idea of a progressive education for a child to reach their full potential and actively promote and participate in society began in the late 1880s and became widespread for about the next 40 years within Lebanon County. John Dewey was the founder of this movement and was one of the most prominent American scholars in the first half of the 20th century. Along with that, three obsolete schools were abandoned and demolished in the area of Jonestown this year as well. What you're seeing here is the interior, I believe, of the Groff School, where they have all their books and so forth up there with a picture of Lincoln and Washington in the front. And that was due to the opening of a school like this, which was later converted to the church home of Jonestown. While several schools such as Laurel Grove, Mount Zion, North Cornwall's Fairview Grammar, and Miner's Village Schoolhouse has still had their original appearance when this movement began. You can see the comparison of the top row to the bottom row is what you would see there today. In 1890, there were almost 2,000 students enrolled within the schools in Lebanon City. So in order to meet the demands of increasing enrollments in overcrowded conditions, they invested time, energy, and money into several new educational buildings over the next three years. Shown here are the twin educational building campus that opened on the corner of 10th and Willow this same year. They appear to be more stately and collegiate rather than just public school buildings. Excuse me a second, Jared. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I believe this is a colorized photo that was borrowed from one of our antique postcards. And although it is a beautiful image of the school building, there are some things that might not look quite right uh, to the viewers or, and to me. It sort of reminds me of when we played that children's game called, what's wrong with this picture? So if you would, I'd like you to identify and tell us a little bit about this particular postcard type photo, Jared. That's a very good question there. Um, I see a couple of things that are kind of inconsistent with pictures like this. One being the title it says high school, but this was actually two separate buildings. The one in the background with the archways was the high school. And the one in the foreground here on the right was Stevens Junior High to start. So in reality, the caption should be high school and Stevens building. And I happen to notice that in a lot of these pictures, the uh, proportions aren't quite right with other objects surrounding it, such as, Dad, we think of the, the people there. Yeah, definitely. The, the people are not to proper scale. And oftentimes what happened, especially with postcards, the artists that did those renderings or did enhancements by colorizing a black and white photo, they took the liberty with certain objects that they added later. And that could include people, horse and buggies, carriages, uh, or even automobiles. And um, oftentimes they made those other images that they added look much smaller. And the buildings look disproportionately larger. And I think we have a few other shots that you can show what a portion of that building actually looks like today to put it into the proper scale. That's right, I do. Actually, that's the next picture here. As I mentioned in the first lecture, the structure to the east, later referred to as the Harding Building, included a rear annex where that arrow is pointing to in the south and remained the city's high school until 1918, when the new high school at 6th and Chestnut Streets was completed. And that became, this became a junior high, what you see here. 
when it was a junior high, it suffered a catastrophic fire a little bit later on. I believe it was 1933. Yes. The western side of the campus included a new building constructed on the former stone foundation of the Lebanon Academy named Stevens Junior High, and that was converted to a primary grade building in 1918. This is the one that I explained before that served until the 1960s and was demolished in 68, except for where that arrow is, the Northwestern Staircase Bell Tower at Tenth and Willow to make way for the Stevens Towers high-rise complex you see here. You can see a better view from 10th Street from an actual photo of what it looks like today, along with the newspaper clipping on the right when the remainder of the structure was being raised. Now, along with that new campus at 10th and Willow, four new central schools were proposed and built within Lebanon City for each respective area over the next 10 years. In the north, a typical year of school, let's say at the Lebanon Independent Borough Schoolhouse, later known as Harrison, ran from the first Monday in September and continued for nine months. Children who were in attendance the previous year were given first seats. Others were admitted by permits from the superintendent in order of their application. If you attended Higby at 13th and Lehman, you'd report at 9 a.m., were dismissed for lunch from 11.45 to 1.30 because of walking, <laughs> to eventually end your day at 4.30. The primary students were dismissed earlier if their work was obviously completed first. There was no school December 25th through January 5th at Garfield and other schools in the district like it. Vacation holidays included Easter Monday, Ascension Day, and Pentecostal Monday. So the students purchased their books with prices starting, if you can believe, as low as one cent. Everyone walked to a school building like Washington here, but didn't necessarily attend the closest school, as my father mentioned in a little bit in the first part we talked about. Gender determined which one you attended around the turn of the century. So Stevens, Fairview, Lincoln, and Lindley Murray were original female attended schools only where uh, Mifflin, Higby, Burroughs, and Franklin were male. Tuition for non-residents was about a dollar per month and primary children and three dollars for high school. At this time, the grade level classification was primary, secondary, intermediate, second grammar, and first grammar schools. Those were two years apiece. So when you advance from section B to A with each promotion, a child in intermediate A would equate to a sixth grader today, and they would graduate to second grammar B, which would be seventh grade. And after completing that first grammar top level, the students would spend three years in higher school levels before actually graduating. So most only attended for eight years, not many completed the full. And you may have noticed a similar appearance to Harrison, Stevens, Higby, Sunnyside, the first Harding Junior High, West Lebanon, Higby, and Fredericksburg High School. Well, it's because they were all designed by one of Lebanon's oldest and most prominent architects, Harvey Thomas Hauer. We believe it's important to know and mention all of his creations, but we're not going to go through every single one. So the, the functional elements he featured on his residential, commercial, industrial and institutional structures were easily identified. The designs adorned many states throughout the region. In 1890 was around the peak design period for Hauer, being commissioned for nearly a dozen structures concurrently at some times. We have them to thank for the many buildings that we can remember, many of which are still standing today. The Rexmont Grammar School opened in 1891, which allowed younger students to begin occupying the smaller Red Grammar Schoolhouse, referred to early on as the Templeman's Number no. 2 on the hillside behind the current Rexmont Fire Company. The building shown in this picture up at the site of the park was used until 28 and demolished about five years afterward. A college that may not be as familiar as Albright in Myerstown or Lebanon Valley in Anvil was Lebanon Business College. That was established long before Harrisburg Area Community graced Cumberland Street in Lebanon City. The school began as a charter member of the National Council of Business Schools in 1882, before moving to the upper floors of this building upon the completion of 8th Street in 1892. 
known today as Lebanon Farmers Market, followed by its final destination, the former Farmers Trust building next to the old courthouse on Cumberland Street. The college offered various courses of study as seen here in this pamphlet, along with the enrollment diversity and amenity statistics. If any of you lived in the West Lebanon area, it's possible that you could have attended the West Lebanon or Higby High School as it was called later on. It would have appeared to train passengers like this from a distance. Upon closer inspection, it looks very little like the current structure that remains today, other than the small office building in the front and lack of dormers and bell tower. This building underwent many modifications over the years, but remains standing in about this condition that you see here. It continues to serve the West Lebanon community as their current municipal building, as well as the smaller schoolhouse across the street. The previous building replaced the earlier Gothic revival style two room structure, which was renovated to accommodate the intermediate grades and renamed the West Lebanon Harrison Schoolhouse. The mimeograph machine made its debut in 1895, which is the predecessor to the photocopier, allowing staff to reproduce a master sheet with bluish purple transfer of ink and turning a crank in a circle to produce as many copies as needed instead of writing each copy out by hand. Another new school was built in Myerstown at the corner of South Railroad and Park Streets in 1895. When both larger schools in the town were finished being constructed, the eight one-room and one teacher schoolhouses were closed. So grades one through eight were consolidated to this College Street building. Uh, and then nine through 12 attended this building. A large addition was added in the 30s to the previous Railroad Street building. And this one eventually was sold to Albright College to become Moan Hall, better known as that. Lebanon Valley College grew steadily during its first 35 years, particularly between 1897 and 1904. The campus had expanded to include Angle Hall, home of the music department, and a partially completed library at this time, funded by Andrew Carnegie, along with the South Hall, previously part of the Lebanon Valley Academy and the administration building seen here in this collage. So these subscription schools around this time were taught in the English language versus the German dialect previously being the standard. Here's an article that mentions how individual and subscription schools were often housed in the teacher's homes. Anvil, one of the first areas to establish schools in the county was the last to close the one room schoolhouses. So before the start of the century, there were no dedicated high school buildings really in the county. The closest thing was the grammar school where those students were housed. However, shortly after the century began, four-year high schools accredited by the state began to spread throughout the county. And they were later graded into primary, secondary, intermediate, grammar, and high school levels. The six-year junior senior schools came into being around this time and the automobile had quite the influence on the county school system at the turn of the century. School buses began to transport students, which helped the districts become more centralized. And by 1900, 31 states had compulsory school attendance for ages eight to 14. The Washington School, one of my favorite schools, was built in Lebanon City, obviously honoring our first president. It was situated on the northwest corner of Third and Chestnut Streets, Parades often passed by the early part of the 20th century, along with the city street fair for the area in many later years. But after the consolidation of schools in 72, Washington was eliminated and demolished to make way for the Washington Arms Senior Housing Complex seen here. The former Red Brick Cornwall High School building, later used for vocational work, was originally designed as a two-story building by Abner Augustus Richter, but plans were later revised to a longer single-story structure as seen in this photo. The building opened in the fall of 02, Cornwall Center, along Bismarck Road, or what we know today as Freeman Drive, just west of the Five Points intersection to the front of the former Robert H. Coleman estate. It was used as a combined grade in high school until the new consolidated building across the street was finished in 27. They replaced, this replaced the area's former 
Cornwall Township Central District High School of Bismarck, later known to folks living today as Quentin Elementary. It was a step forward in the modern consolidation system that children who had completed the elementary grades in the Bird Coleman and Miners Village schools entered the advanced grades in this building. It was again renovated in 60, later used for vocational classes, followed by the closure in the early 70s upon the opening of the Cedar Crest schools, and sadly demolished in 07. Today, a small garden is situated on the site of this former structure, but the brown sandstone columns, wall, wrought iron gates, and underground tunnel remain as a reminder of one of the first steps in higher education throughout the Cornwall Lebanon School District. The Schuylkill Seminary, established in nearby Reading in 1881, moved to Fredericksburg, of all places, in, 19, in 1886, which returned to Reading this year, 1902, after occupying this building. It was renamed the Schuylkill College in 23 and merged with Albright College five years later. Miles Bressler, a cigar manufacturer, purchased the former Schuylkill Seminary building in 07 and repurposed it into a large cigar factory that remained in business until the 30s. The Bressler Cigar Company was locally known as the Factory on the Hill. Now here's what you see today if you stumbled upon the farm where it exists. Although I don't know where this is at, so I'd be curious to see. I've been looking around the maps, I can't find it. Now on Christmas Eve, 1904, the original administration building you see here caught fire at the Lebanon Valley College. The cause was never determined and had to be rebuilt by the spring of 05, so this new building was completed by the beginning of the next school term. As a result of the Civil War, a new industrial group made its influence on education around this point, and by 1906, committees on curriculum recommended that a boy's education be more practical, where girls were focused more on domestic sciences. With the hiring of manual labor training instructors and science teachers, Vocational trades made their debut in the school scene. They also hired a shorthand and typing teacher as the professional industries expedited the in-demand clerical work. The Richland Borough School District was founded the previous year in 1907, followed by the St. Cyril and Methodius Catholic School opened at their church on East Lehman Street in Lebanon City. The Donagmore Elementary Building, however, at 19th and Chestnut Streets, also opened the same year. It was renovated a little bit later in 57, at which time it was converted to an additional elementary school for the district. After the period of consolidation, it was placed on the market for sale, but still stands as a private apartment complex today. In 1909, the Washington Grade School in South Amble Township opened, and the Honorable Heinrich Henry Halk an educator and teacher since age 16, served in public office as county, city, and state superintendent, was very instrumental in not only developing a new wave of education in central PA, but also helped to establish the first educational system in Puerto Rico around 1901. The building named in honor of him was this structure you see here, built in 09, I believe, and was the first of the two Henry Houck schools. It was abandoned in the summer of 24, and sold to a private party at a public sale on October 17th, 1925. So if you live near or ever pass by 515 to 519 East Weidman Street, take notice of the red brick building on the north side. Much like other schools of that era that have survived, the large windows have been reduced to mask its original identity. And little is known or documented about this building other than the abandonment and sale. So if you happen to know anything additional, feel free to Send us a message about it. This beautiful building, the Sunnyside School, was also completed the same year at the intersection of 422 and Laurel Avenue between West Lebanon's Pleasant Hill and Cleona. It was converted to the Henai's Tire Company building as shown in this 1957 photo, I believe, with the school in the background. The structure today has been restored and modernized along with a fresh coat of paint to reflect its original design by architect Harvey Hauer. Prior to 1900, children with disabilities were educated either at home or sent to state institutions. Now, separate school buildings for children with disabilities 
were first built in the teens and 20s, the earliest with private funds, of course. These included enrollment for children who were anemic, pre-tubercular, blind, deaf, or crippled. They included many special features, such as ramps, open-air classrooms, and response to the disability that was to be accommodated at the school. Apologize for the picture. It's the best one I could get. But students began filling the halls of the new high school building in Richland in this photo. And one you may drive by on any given day if you're traveling from Lebanon to Anvil on Route 422, the Cleona School debuted in 1912 as the area's consolidated school, later serving as Cleona's Borough Hall. But now, I believe, it houses a private business office. World War I began the following summer, impacting many Lebanon County parents and students' educations for the next four consecutive years. Mount Gretna, just outside of Lebanon, was the precursor to the PA Army National Guard encampment of Fort Indian Town Gap, which was utilized up to during and following World War I. St. Gertrude's School began offering students parochial courses at their building between 1st and 2nd Avenue on Lehman Street, shown here. The building is now the St. Cecilia Religious Education Center, as seen here next to the original St. Gertrude's building on the left. Myerstown's new high school was completed and opened at South Railroad Street at West Carpenter Avenue in 1915. Further consolidation of that district resulted in the closing of the College Street building, I showed you earlier, transferring students to this structure. Today, it's used as the town's municipal building, or borough hall, if you want to call it that, after being occupied by a church for a number of years. And then on January 21st, 1914, the directors decided to erect a school building on South Railroad Street in Palmyra. That was completed and dedicated the following October. The building served the needs of the community for its public school, grades 1 through 12, until the end of the 36-37 school term. Labor and industry condemned the Railroad Street building in 78, and the district sold it to the Palmyra Council of Churches, who in turn raised the building and constructed the Interfaith Manor Senior Citizen Housing Complex. That new building I just showed you replaced the first four-room high school on College Street, now the home of the appropriately named Schoolhouse Antiques. And by 1918, every U.S. state required students to complete elementary grade courses. So the Office of the Superintendent records show the earliest closing of one-room schools came in 1913 in Heidelberg, 18 in South Lebanon, and 19 in North Lebanon. The town outside of Cornwall, formerly named Bismarck, would forever be immortalized during World War I after changing its name to honor Theodore Roosevelt's son, Quentin, after perishing in a dogfight via airplane over France, July 14, 1918. Cornwall Central District High School, later Bismarck High, was later changed to the Quentin School to reflect the community's updated name. The monument, plaque, and former church bell stand across Route 419 where the school once stood. A new elementary building was constructed for Palmyra primary grades over the summer and opened in the fall of 18 on South Railroad Street as well. And although overcrowding continued to plague Lebanon City Schools, it wasn't until 1915 that they were able to secure a quarter block square at 6th and Chestnut Streets for the construction of a new senior high. The lot was purchased in April and work began the following spring. Now, because of the rising construction cost due to World War I, the delays lasted until early 18, to which they completed the new high school building at a total cost of 350000 What's interesting is that the date stone featured in the right photo says 1916, but it wasn't until later on that they were able to occupy the building and have it, the dedication ceremonies. It was the, one of the best designed and constructed buildings of its time and was a tribute to the people's interest in education. This was the second co-ed senior high school in the city, demoting and renaming the former high school at Willow and Partridge Streets to Harding Junior High on November 18th. 1918. And due to its overall large size and scalability, it temporarily served as a junior and senior high school following a 1933 fire. Thankfully, this is another example of a structure that's adapted and improved with age. We know this building today, obviously, is the Harding Elementary. 
Another important step in the development of the county schools in the mid-20s was the introduction of vocational courses, such as agriculture, business, industrial arts, etc. The courses, although very new at the time, were quick to take hold in Lebanon County, one of the state's leading agricultural areas. Just after the Milbach Elementary School opened in 23, all remaining one-room schoolhouses were closed in the Shaperstown area after the 25 school year. The new Henry Houck Junior High building was constructed during the 24-25 school year and included a few elementary students within the same structure. Also named for Henry, as we learned about earlier, this was the direct replacement of the former structure of the same name on Weidman Street. Since there was a great expansion and annexation to the city to the Northeast, a new building was required. So this one began construction in 24, opened its doors this following year. So 315 East Lehman Street became the newest junior high on the northeastern end of town, integrating a few elementary classrooms at the time as well. It was renovated in 56 and 71, converting all rooms to serve as strictly an elementary grade levels in preparation for the 72 school year. And then it became known as Henry Halk Elementary. The middle and late 20s also marked the greatest strides in school health programs. Under the former superintendent's administration, a public school's nursing program was adopted with its parallel program of dental hygiene. These went into effect there long before they were made a state requirement. More recent was the addition of special education for children who require special attention, especially in the matter of speech correction. A new high school was completed at 205 South Oak Street in Anvil, which opened in September of 26. The 35 classroom nicknamed Greystone Building served as the high school until 56 in the Anvil Clayona School District. In the late 50s, a new high school building was constructed at the site of the current high middle school at 500 South White Oak Street. This building you see here was expanded and became the new Anvil Elementary. Also the South Lebanon Elementary School consists of a former high and junior high as you can kind of see in that left picture there of the Ionian from 1955. <laughs> it opened in 26, used strictly as the high school, being built from an earlier frame structure across the road. And it was converted to a junior high after the renovations of the building took place in 32 and 41. A structure annexed to the building of 52 was also included to that. And the conversion to a complete elementary complex was finished in September of 72. I believe it now has over 50 classrooms. Originally referred to as the Cornwall Consolidated High School, it opened for the 27-28 term as one of the leading educational facilities in the state, just after Cornwall officially became a borough on October 11th of the previous year, creating the Cornwall Borough School District. Here's a rear shot of the building, noticing the former high school on the left, revealing the empty field which sat where the new complex resides now. It was designed by architects Barris T. Ritter, and Lewis Howell Shea. Ritter, who also designed structures such as the PA Farm Show Complex, along with many other buildings in the surrounding county and states. A large brick addition was added to the Western Rear in 57, which enabled the district to also use it as a junior high until Cedar Crest High School was built 10 years later. It became an elementary school following the completion of the Cedar Crest Middle School in 72. The old Ebenezer Elementary School, situated in North Lebanon Township, was once owned and operated by the Cornwall Lebanon School District beginning in 28. The secondary school of Palmyra Borough received classification as a sixth junior senior high school that same year. It provided secondary education not only for the borough of Palmyra, but also for the town of North Londonderry. Legend has it that the area called Ebenezer, long before the school existed, was named after George Dawson Coleman's friend, Daniel Webster's father, Ebenezer. <laughs> we have no, found no evidence otherwise that suggests any other person affiliated with Lebanon with that name. So in 48, another additional classrooms were uh, added to this as part of the building program for the district. Five other one-room schoolhouses in the Northern Lebanon district were closed and abandoned during the same time frame. So a year later, it was decided to close the remaining two-room Rhinelsville building and all students in the North Lebanon district begin attending this school. So it had been renovated a few times, 
having a total of about 15 to 20 classrooms to this current day. And we know it as the uh, New Covenant Christian School. Speaking of Christian schools, St. Joseph Convent, shown on the left, paired with the newer structure on the right, became the campus for Lebanon Catholic's first high school, which opened that same year. This shows the connected buildings today that faced Willow Street, which was later occupied by the Calvary Chapel congregation. The original Shaperstown High School was built in 36 and used as an elementary through high school until the mid-60s, with a merger of four towns in the eastern part of the county, creating the Elko School District, converting the building to elementary grades only. It was later transformed into the Shaperstown Mennonite High School in the fall of 2015. The County Board of Directors was organized on December 14th of 37, and its personnel was made up of directors from all the districts throughout the county. Spring marked the completion of a new junior-senior high school building on West Cherry Street under the Federal Emergency Administration of Public Works in Palmyra. With the beginning of the 37-38 school term, the building housed grades 7 through 12 on the Railroad Street building, and this one was the uh, grades 1 through 6. So a 10-room addition to the Cherry Street building was completed in 81. The Lawn Elementary building, which was constructed in 36, was abandoned and sold during, I believe, the summer of 81. And since that, the district housed grades K through 5 in the Pine Street, Forge Road, and Northside Elementary Schools, 6 through 9 in the Middle School on Cherry Street, and 10 through 12 at the Palmyra High School. I believe, according to this picture, private business occupies the old building at the present. Lebanon's newest high school moved forward this year to the sum of a $1 million price tag. Prior to its opening, high school students would attend the Lebanon High Building at 6th and Chestnut for half days. The junior high students and teachers from that building that burned were attending the other half. So this lasted for about five years until the opening of this building at North 8th and Church Streets in 38. The architectural style was used for many Lebanon, Dauphin, Lancaster, and Cumberland area schools during the Great Depression and World War II. It eventually became the Lebanon Junior High School in 6th grade 7 and 8, followed by a minor renovation in 72. It was rebranded by the Lebanon Middle School in 92 when grade 6 was added and currently used for the same grades, having the famous Lebanon Cedar Sports Stadium to the rear. Lebanon Valley College's Physical Education Building also opened this year, honoring the longtime involvement of the Lynch family. The use of transparent sheets for overhead projection, also called view foils or view graphs, was largely developed in the United States. Overhead projectors were introduced in the U.S. military training during World War II as early as 1940 and were quickly being taken up by educators. So within the decade, they were being used by companies as well. And after the war, they were used at schools like the U.S. Military Academy first. A few years later, the conversion of the six six system of grades was completed within the county. And in the 1950s, there were only 21 teacher schools in operation in the county system. 86 of the one teacher schools were closed since 1911 during that decade. The Cornwall Joint School District was formed and then consisted of three subdivisions, as you see here, Cornwall Borough, North and West Cornwall Townships. In July, the Jonestown Borough, Bethel, Cold Springs, Watara, and Union Townships organized to become the Northern Lebanon County Joint School System. By 54, one-room schoolhouses were no longer used, and all North Lebanon Township children attended the Ebenezer School. From the building now, that's the current Lebanon Middle School in 38, the district didn't construct any new buildings until 1954, when they opened the two modern elementary school buildings, Southeast and Southwest. These buildings marked the beginning of a long road to update the elementary facilities, which had, with age and use, become obsolete. In 1954, the Lebanon School Board asked the public for help in naming the two elementary schools they were building at the time. So, the area schools were often named after prominent people, such as presidents, politicians, educators, business owners, etc. And Eisenhower won the contest the same day he was inaugurated to his second term for president 
for the Southwest School. Second place winner would have been chosen for Southeast was Norman Booker, a Cumberland County native and LVC alumni who taught over 5,800 students in his career. And you can see the long list of 20 some people that were chosen as runners up. It was through the 1960s that the United States had a racially segregated system of schools. And it was despite the 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education Supreme Court ruling. Thank goodness by the late 70s, segregation was eliminated. The North Anvil Elementary building was completed and updated in 1990. The district closed the building in 2010 because of declining enrollment. So they began renting a portion of it to, I believe, the Grace Life Church and Yellow Breaches Educational Center. I think it was to be sold in 2016, but I'm not sure whatever came of it. The Northern Lebanon School District voted to merge all their districts in November, becoming effective in July the following year. Ground was broken on March 3rd, 57, for the new Northern Lebanon High School, and building operations began immediately, just three years after the district was formed. Students began attending the new high school from all the surrounding townships, and it was ready by September 58. The Ford Street Elementary School in Palmyra was also comprised of 14 classrooms and situated on a 13-acre tract of land and completed in October that same year. Lebanon Catholic abandoned this building on Willow Street in spring of 59 to begin a new school year in the fall at their new location across from the old Donegmore Railroad Station in Pleasant Hill. The new facility offered many more classrooms than their previous Willow Street campus, along with a full gymnasium and cafeteria. During the 59-60 school term, a project involving the complete renovation of the Palmyra Area Railroad and Cherry Street buildings, as well as the building of an addition thereto was completed. The Railroad Street building housed junior high students. And the Cherry Street building had senior high. Sadly, the Mifflin School in Lebanon City was demolished to make way for the new San Giorgio plant and office the previous year. And the North Lebanon Township schools were added to the jointure of the Cornwall Lebanon Suburban Joint School System, followed by South Lebanon in 61. The following year, the Palmyra, North Londonderry Township, and South Londonderry Township School Districts merged to form the Palmyra Area School District, or what we know today, followed by the construction of the 20-classroom Pine Street Elementary School, which was completed for occupancy in September of 61. The new Elko High School opened in 62 and underwent extensive renovations in 91, which is still being used today in eastern Lebanon County. On July 1st of 64, West Lebanon Township formed a single administrative unit with Lebanon City School District and was renamed to the current name simply Lebanon School District. The West Lebanon High School, later referred to as Higby High, became an added facility at that time. Plans were now in the works by Lebanon City School Board to construct a newer, larger high school, but the location was up for debate. During the 65-66 school year, while Cedar Crest was still being constructed, Grades 10 through 12 attended Cornwall High, while all the junior high students were at South Lebanon High School. During the next school year, Mount Gretna Borough students began to attend the Cornwall area schools, and it was decided to rename it the Cornwall Lebanon School District. So Cedar Crest High School along East Scarborough Green Road in South Lebanon was completed in the middle of the year with over 50 classrooms. A new addition was completed in the spring of 72, and this one holds a special place in my heart because I was the last class to graduate of the previous millennium. Now, the 16 classroom Northside Elementary School in Palmyra was occupied in September of 67, and all six school districts participated in the operation of the Lebanon County Area Vocational Technical School. Some know it simply as the VOTEC which was jointly constructed by all the districts and completed this year. Today, it's known as the Lebanon County Career and Technology Center. The new high school at 1000 South 8th Street was dedicated October 12, 1969, after the much anticipated planning and three years of construction. The building cost the district five and a half million and was designed to accommodate almost 2000 students at the time. No, these are not UFO landing pads. It's an aerial view of the high school 
which was designed with three two-story circular buildings with interconnecting glass enclosed walkways. Each building included a core facility around the related sections were built. So some refer to it as the Three Ring Circus, a contemporary space-saving modern 60s design that helped achieve the intentions of the school board to provide a larger junior high campus on 8th and Church Streets, moving the senior high students to the new building. This serves as the current Lebanon High and received quite an extensive renovation in 2013, adding a few additional sections, closing the courtyard to create an atrium, eliminating the connecting corridors along many other updates and additions. Dad, tell me what it was like to attend school in 1969 at this one. Sure. Well, before I mention that, I'll just say that although I lived directly across the street from the former Lebanon High School on North 8th Street, uh, when this new high school was built, uh, instead of walking across the street to go to school, I had to walk two miles and it was uphill both ways, literally, because the Quibahilla <laughs> Creek was at the lowest point in town and it was midway. So it definitely was uphill both ways. Uh, with respect to this school, though, um, notably, I was part of the first sophomore class and the third graduating class from Lebanon Senior High School in 1972. Other distinct changes that were introduced at this school that were notable is that we had 18 to 20 short modules rather than the traditional six to eight class periods per day. That round building shape and unique class structure still has many students literally going in circles the first few months they attend. Uh, additionally, about this school, uh, it's a milestone for me personally, since it will commemorate my 50-year high school graduation reunion. And as Jared mentioned earlier, uh, with respect to those renovations that were made to the center atrium, a fellow uh, close personal friend of mine, an alumnus, uh, Tom Jordan, who was the high school football coach, athletic director, and he became the principal of Lebanon High School. Uh, he will actually be giving everyone a tour of that facility uh, in June. Uh, we're also going to be attending the uh, commencement exercise for the graduating class of 2022. And another 72 alumnus of Lebanon High is a lifelong friend, Kevin Shrum, who retired in 2019 as the administrator of Lebanon County's Mental Health, Intellectual Disabilities, and Early Intervention Program. Kevin is also an avid researcher, like Jared and, and me, and uh, He's very interested in Lebanon's historical facts, and he's provided some of the enhanced and colorized antique uh, photos of the schools that we used. Um, I'm happy to say that it was the first time in my life that I attended a new school. The three previous schools that I went to were buildings that were all over 100 years old, so it was really a, a big change for me, and I really enjoyed it uh, attending this school. Glad to go back in next month. That's great. And, and <clears throat> one of the marked advancements was the introduction of the long overdue kindergarten program at the time when that school was built. So it was now possible for the increased number of buildings that were available that they could do that. So the former Lebanon Senior High here, Nathan Church, was converted to a middle school at the time to which it currently serves. Now, as desktop and scientific calculators were in their prime, pocket calculators emerged in the early 70s and quickly became the popular in schools by offering an alternative to the slide rule. Dad, what exactly did you use a slide rule for? <laughs> yeah, I know I'm <laughs> dating myself again, but I'm very familiar with the devices that you're showing here. Well, prior to handheld electronic digital calculators, personal computers, smartphones, tablets, and the like, the method of performing mathematical calculations was done by using a slide rule. It's a simple handheld mechanical analog device with a sliding scale, and it's used to find the answer to math functions and equations. It was actually invented by Reverend William Outred in 1622. He was a pretty smart guy a long time ago, and he created both the rectangular and circular shapes and forms in different sizes. The accuracy of the longer slide rules is able to be precise to four decimal places. And throughout the 1700s, 1900s slide rules were primarily used by engineers, scientists, astronomers, and mathematicians to rapidly solve complex technical problems. They were mostly used, as I said, in the scientific field and in industry in the era to design all types of machinery, equipment, automobiles, aircraft, military, and was an integral part of rocket science technology, believe it or not. 
uh, during the time when I attended high school and college, we actually had textbooks and lab classes to train us how to use a slide rule. Again, before handheld calculators were invented and became readily available. Uh, but that time was also the dawning of the age of digital electronics and it spawned new buzzwords and terms like we use today, terms like hardware, software, and of course, high tech. <laughs> and all of that literally began to transform and shape our modern civilization, civilization and accelerated the rate of education, in my opinion, post the Vietnam wartime era. Yeah, thank you for that. That that kind of sums up what those were uh, was were used for. Um, now, with the closing of the office of the county superintendent on July first, seventy one, the Lebanon school district became part of the Lancaster Lebanon Intermediate Unit, or IU thirteen, with all Lebanon and Lancaster County school districts joining later for special services to educate the youth of both counties. As you can see there on that map, it was kind of blurry. Sorry about that. Seventy two was an active, interesting yet challenging year for Lebanon. The area endured infrastructure changes, a shift in student grades, and the conversion of many former junior high union schools to elementary facilities, along with the severe weather striking during the summer. Coincidentally, Mike Weber will be offering a lecture related to this one month from today on Hurricane Agnes and how it will be affected in Lebanon Valley. I know I'll be checking that one out for sure. Other than a few blizzards and numerous fires, there was really no single destructive event quite like Agnes that halted almost every aspect of infrastructure in the Northeast, impacting communities, education, sanitation, construction, and production in an immediate single week. So as a result of this, Burroughs, Franklin, Lincoln, Higby, Harrison, Garfield, and Washington were abandoned, kind of the nail in the coffin for these schools, and demolished several years later following the tragedy. Some of the attributing reasons otherwise were due to land transfers, but also the shift in the mindset of the public school boards. Cedar Crest Middle School, adjacent to the high school, opened its doors in January. After battling Hurricane Agnes in June, the students from the former Cornwall and South Lebanon Middle Schools began attending the new one in September of that year. As a result of that opening, Cornwall Elementary Complex was converted K through five September that year. During that same school year, the construction of the Palmyra Area School was completed at a cost of just a little over $6 million. And the 72-73 school year marked the closing of the Campbelltown School, and the property was transferred to South Londonderry Township the next year. Old Northwest Elementary at 900 Maple Street in Lebanon City opened in the fall of 76 after a land swap with the city of Lebanon, exchanging the properties and four other elementary buildings, Lincoln, Lindley, Murray, Garfield, and Harrison, to which three of the four would end up as parking lots. Again, a naming contest ensued, which presented names such as Kennedy, Stites, Fort Light, William Penn, along with other potential names. It cost the city three and a half million to construct, serving Lebanon City until 2018, when the replacement cost under the same name was built south of the foothills of Coleman's Park, near the old North Lebanon furnaces. The current owner, Quartz Creek Holdings, is set to transform the building into a office commerce space. A scary event occurred at 4 a.m. on March 28, 1979 at MedEd's Three Mile Island Nuclear Power Plant in Middletown, about 25 miles from Lebanon. Parents and students were alerted throughout the morning with uncertainty as to what occurred because it was affecting people in the area and ultimately they were distracted and misinformed by media frenzy, ensuing panic to residences in nearby towns as well. After deliberations between the state governor's office, MedEd, GPU, and leaders of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, state officials encouraged women, children, and elderly residents to evacuate as far as a 15-mile radius in case of a full meltdown, which temporarily impacted school attendance and operations in the surrounding counties. Lebanon County being downwind of potential fallout from the incident caused some residents to take necessary precautions to leave town and stay with relatives out of the potential danger zone. In the case of a large-scale radiation leak at unsafe levels, the residents, businesses, and schools would have to be required to be abandoned and vacant for hundreds of years at the worst-case scenario. Cleanup began in 79 and officially ended in December of 93 with a total cleanup cost of about a billion dollars. Keep in mind that this was just another example of a man-made disaster that affected education. Moving on to 1980, Lindley Murray had been closed for a few years at this point, so it was time to either sell or lease it. 
coincidentally, we figured out that this was the oldest public school in Lebanon City still standing today. Didn't know if you knew that, but it was decided that the city would lease it to the Lebanon, Lancaster Lebanon IU 13 group that same year until they vacated to house themselves in this building on Cumberland Street and Lincoln Avenue, the old Bethlehem Steel office building. The personal computer debuted in schools across the country in the last few years here, paving the way for these two popular models to be introduced, the Apple II and the IBM 5150 PC, forever competing in space in Lebanon County school classrooms and labs. This led to new innovations for forever changing the way students access info, complete assignments, tackle projects, simulate scenarios, take tests, etc. I mean, where will we be without computers today in education? So dad, tell me what you remember about the rivalry between these two brands. Well, very quickly, uh, the Microsoft or what are known today as the Windows-based systems focus more on doing the basic business tasks. And they were used also in industrial equipment controllers, part of early factory automation systems. Microsoft more or less became the de facto standard PC software through their exclusive relationship that they cemented with IBM. Then later on, Microsoft offered their own hardware. The Apple One, Two, and later uh, what involved, evolved into the Macintosh-based systems provided a more complex tool set with an easier graphical user interface. And that allowed individuals to, uh, to operate more in a collaborative way and it enabled them to become more highly creative in my opinion. Consequently, the Apple systems became an early platform for education and academics with greater emphasis on the arts, music, and sciences. In today's world, current laptops and desktops offer multiple operating systems, and they all have sort of similar applications that are available across um, their operating system and cloud-based user networks. Uh, do you want me to move on? Uh, this next slide showing the dawning of the space age by NASA and there were many successes uh, in the 60s and 70s, and it was followed by the space shuttle program in the 80s uh, with a space plane that launched larger crew sizes and satellites, space telescopes, and it connected them to the space lab. However, at the pinnacle of success, sometimes that leads to greater risk taking. And as we push the envelope of technology while attempting to advance as state of the art, uh, things kind of went bad. Um, unfortunately, uh, at that time, NASA was inviting the first female high school social studies teacher, Kristen McAuliffe, who was a civilian, not a professional astronaut, to participate in what was called the Teacher in Space Program. And that was announced by then President Ronald Reagan to recognize the teaching profession and to encourage education in space. Unfortunately, this accelerated mission led to the catastrophic explosion that I'm sure most people remember, a Challenger STS-51L. Soon after it was launched, it destroyed the shuttle and the seven astronauts on board. And sadly, it was witnessed by many children who watched it via satellite on TV in their classrooms. Uh, during that same week, I was selected to be part of the technical team to identify the root cause of that accident. So that's pretty near and dear to my heart. Uh, that tragic loss caused a major setback and slowed down the space shuttle program for two years before the next launch occurred. And the next teacher was launched 22 years later. The lesson learned there is that sometimes accidents happen in life. And the important thing is, what, what do we learn from it? How can we make changes to improve life? And ultimately, I think that's the purpose and the essence of education itself. Yeah, it was another one of those man-made disasters. disasters. Right. Um, yeah, I remember watching that live in my elementary classroom as well. So it was, yeah. it was a bit tragic at the time. Microsoft PowerPoint debuted in the 89-90 school year for the computer users to utilize a digital overhead projector connection that enlarged and mimicked the computer screen for presentations. The slide-based viewing and presentation interface forever changed the way teachers, students, professionals, freelancers, and other groups present their content like we are tonight, precisely. <clears throat> because the current Cornwall Lebanon forms a ring around the city school district, students from North Lebanon were now being bused to the elementary schools in the southern part of the county, prior to Union Canal being built in the 89-90 school year. Administrators and board members united for a tour of the new Union Canal School on August 20th, 1990, which opened with about a little over 400 students that September 5th to begin the 90-91 school year. 15-acre site was chosen in North Lebanon 
at a total price tag of about five and a half million, 15, or I'm sorry, a 55 square foot, 55,000 square foot facility. And it was situated on the eastern side of Narrows Drive at Mallard Lane. The elementary schools began to get full again in the next coming years. So they renovated it in 95, I believe. And the school was built to supplement the growth in North Lebanon while the old Ebenezer Elementary School was getting too small. So the modern school still serves elementary students to this present day. On, October, on August 2nd, 1990, the Iraqi military invaded the neighboring state of Kuwait and had fully occupied the country within two days of discussed and was discussed frequently at many parents of students were called to serve in the Gulf over the next 30 years. Smart technology and digital projection was introduced in the classrooms in the mid-90s, which became the standard medium for teaching. Standard whiteboards and transparency overhead projectors began to decline as smart boards emerged to dominate the beginning of the 21st century, enabling teachers and students to interactively touch the screen to manipulate text, numbers, graphics, etc. on the familiar TV-style device that we use today. A new Ebenezer school was completed during the 96-97 school year and featured a higher student capacity and better technology infrastructure at the time. Apparently, North Lebanon was expanding faster than South Lebanon and Cornwall, which prompted the need for more school space. They were taking in kids from Avon Heights and South Lebanon when Union Canal was finished, so those kids were transferred there, which allowed more space in the South Lebanon Elementary for future expansion. The old Ebenezer school was growing too small, so the school district gave it to the township, which they sold it. The agreement was the school district would get some of the money. And it was that year that Cedar Crest Middle School added a new wing with the cafetorium with music rooms and the high school science wing. Possibly the most useful tool that gained popularity at the end of the 21st or 20th century was the internet, also known as the web, made its debut to schools creating their websites. I was very fortunate to be a founding member of the technology club at Cedar Crest High School. My peers and I worked to create the first 100% student designed school website in the county during the 97 98 year. While primitive at the time, our manual coding included high resolution images and graphics with news, teacher profiles, feature students, schedules, athletics, etc. And finally, the last school in the area to be built in the 20th century, I believe, was Ebenezer Elementary in North Lebanon. The 21st century ra raced into Lebanon integrating the latest technology, innovation, and expansion of several area schools. These interactive whiteboards pioneered handwriting recognition for note-taking, solving math problems, playing games, graphics apps, and other interactive media types. The new Anvil Cleona combined middle and high school campus was completed in 06 with a rather unique architecture. Far from looking like your typical school building, the campus features an agricultural suburban appearance featuring the school colors throughout each structure. They replaced an earlier set of buildings in the same site and provides the latest in classroom technology, athletics, and other scholastic amenities. On April 3rd, 2010, after a successful three years with a multi-touch smartphone, Apple Computer enlarged that device to offer the same technology and compete in the tablet PC market with something called the iPad, another app-based internet communication device allowing full-touch interaction between us and the software. At the time, other manufacturers mostly required a pen stylus to touch the screen. Since then, iPad and Android tablets continue to revolutionize the way most of us work, play, learn, and attend school, no matter what your age or experience, both inside and outside the classroom. And a new Northwest Elementary opened a new 92,000 square foot building in 2018 at 1315 Old Forge Road, which features a STEM-focused learning environment, cafetorium, gymnasium, and educational pond area. This replaced the former Northwest building at 9th and 10th Street, Maple, and became the largest of five elementaries in the district, hosting about 700 students or so. And as we're still feeling the after effects caused by the coronavirus pandemic, remote learning has taken on a whole new meaning by necessity in the last two years. We've been challenged to rethink how we handle distance learning, both in the classroom and at home. 2021 brought Lebanon Catholic High School a uh, combined successor to the Our Lady of the Valley Elementary School, was closed by the Diocese of Harrisburg at the end of previous year. And after a one-year hiatus, Catholic education returned to Lebanon County, resuming a 
161-year tradition. So starting this past September 13th, Our Lady of the Cross School began hosting pre-kindergarten through 12th grade classes at the former Youth for Christ building in North Lebanon Township. Unlike Lebanon Catholic, Our Lady of the Cross will receive no financial support from the diocese or local churches. There was also some uh, construction that's in the works for pretty much all the other school districts, the Lebanon Intermediate School, the Cleona Elementary, and Northern Lebanon Elementary. Progress moves on. So that brings us to today. Sadly, we missed some of the buildings we lost over the last 300 years and hope to prevent it from happening in the future. But one thing's for certain, everything changes in due time. We're all still waiting to hear the plans for Lebanon Catholic's former high school campus. Northwest Elementary, the old one, Elko, North Lebanon's elementary is still being constructed, and countless other treasures to see what will become of those establishments. These potential multi-million dollar projects will provide technology workspaces, science labs, industrial arts, fine arts, and emergency medical technician programs. And then you have the old school guys, Webster, Donegmore, New Salem, Pleasant Sight, still retaining their original look and feel as if untouched in the last half century, while the new Northwest and Ebenezer buildings still have their rookie stripes for the next chapter in education of Lebanon County. I'm often asked what my obsession is with saving old buildings. As we wrap up here, the photos on this page are merely a sample of actual schools still standing scattered throughout the county. Keep in mind that more than a dozen of these schools are hidden in plain sight some standing proud and serving their purpose in other ways, others not so fortunate in the battle of time, withering away year after year. And as we drive on main thoroughfares and back roads, maybe an occasional trip to the grocery store, sightseeing along the highway, we, they are woven into the fabric of the communities that we live. And as you take a look at some of these pictures on here, you can see that they're still around. We might not see them, but they're still there. And I pulled up a little kind of a sad graphic here where it shows a building like you'd see one in Lebanon. There's actually a, a gas can and the caption says it takes energy to construct a new building. It saves energy to preserve an old one. And that's kind of the message that we're trying to get out to people. So what does education look like in the future? We rely upon technology today more than ever. While the manual methods of yesteryear slowly diminish into the abyss of forgotten skills, we interact differently. We share information and learn in a higher dimensional and spatial atmosphere more than ever. Be cautious not to forget how education began or how it evolved to bring us to the present and accelerate us into the not so distant future. Dad, what's that clever saying you always tell everyone? Uh, well, as you know, we're, we're passionate about learning, preserving history and buildings from the past. And I created uh, my personal quotation a long time ago. And it says, the further we progress into the future, the more we discover about the past. Um, and it's because as time passes, we're able to capture a broader view of the events and information after it all happens. Much like the old adage states, hindsight is 2020. Uh, but we have to carefully uncover the details, much like an archaeologist, but much dig deeper and also broader to put all of the pieces of the chronological puzzle together correctly. And, and although in today's technological driven world, we, it virtually gives us instantaneous access to a massive amount of data and information, it still is a great challenge to put these things into proper perspective, to comprehend it, validate it, and to gather all the relevant facts accurately. Uh, and in our view, making a better future is to have a clear understanding of learning from the past. Hence, our parting message to you is tied to preserving history, which is what Jared and I endeavor to do as part of our lifelong mission together. I put a couple examples of places on the screen here that it's always good to volunteer, whether it's at your local library, a historical society, the looking for things at the state archives, that's the new building on the top right, and museums like the Cornwall Iron Furnace. I put a couple information sources on here because we try to not rely on stories more than primary sources of, of information. So a lot of the ones you'll see here with years behind them are books that have been published locally in the area, along with a lot of newspapers, 
few libraries, a lot of personal collections that you can get access to if you ask nicely, and uh, a few online websites. We want to give a shout out to uh, Webtown for uh, giving everyone, creating awareness that we're, that we're doing this sort of a thing. It's important for everyone. And it's been fun sharing all this information with you. We really hope that you learned something you didn't know or sparked a distant memory from your childhood, but we can't forget to thank the ones who made our research and these favorite topics possible over the course of this whole project. So we've enjoyed working with and plan to continuing to partner with the folks at the Furnace, but we also wanted to send a few call outs to people such as uh, you know Mike Henry and uh, Kathy Donaldson for hosting this, uh, Sue Wenzel and Mike Trump, they're also on the board of the Friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace. They've wor been working together as school teachers and historians for many years. I probably spent hundreds of hours on the phone with Sue Wenzel <laughs> for the last couple of years. And uh, a gentleman that contacted me not even a year ago during our last presentation, Jack Kiskadden, most of his photos or most of our photos that we've had on here were from him uh, that were especially the collages and things. He's taken a lot of those and I've been very thankful to have gotten in contact with him because when we don't know something, he usually does. So <laughs> we thank Jim Polchinski as well for mentioning us during the last uh, presentation of his, working on the interpretive signage with the furnace coming up soon. Donald Brown, the National Institute of Deltiology founder, he's still ticking out there. And uh, he was a very big help with the Eastern section of the schools. But we can't forget to thank the Harpel family, the uh, maintainers of their trust and collection that dates back even prior to the Civil War. So um, thanks to Sue Bowman also. She wasn't on this list. She was kind of a late ad. But uh, we really appreciate her exposure and, uh, and gracefulness with her articles that she's published in Lancaster Farming. So thank all the teachers, faculty, and administrators and students out there that you know. We really uh, just... Thank you for joining us for part two of our special presentation for education in Lebanon County, exclusively offered by the Furnace. So although this is all we feature in schools at this time, we have endless data on these places documented in our big database. And uh, don't be shy. Reach out to us. Keep your eyes peeled, and we'll have more exciting content in the future, I'm sure. So appreciate your watching, learning, and participating. Mr. Emery, we'll give it back to you. All right, well, thank you very much, Garrett. Uh, certainly was a trip down memory lane uh, for me, though not necessarily here in Lebanon County. My, my family's from Northwestern Chester County, so uh, experienced quite a few of the same things. Uh, I know my uh, paternal great-grandfather uh, great was in charge of a township school district uh, in the 1930s and 40s and my maternal great-great-grandfather was in charge of the same district at the turn of the century. Uh, so th these are things that I knew about, you know, growing up in my own family, and my parents were of a generation when uh, the jointure of township schools uh, during the consolidation. So this is all, all things that I knew. Uh, but, you know, one of, the, one of the things that came up in our area that, that, I, that I didn't know if it happened here uh, of course, was uh, it, were there any issues with like the plain communities uh, that were living here in Lebanon County? As I'm not really familiar with how early, say, Amish and Plainer Mennonite groups came in, because I know that in the area that I grew up in, uh, that that was a big deal uh, because uh, the plain communities did not want to be bust outside of the area. So that was when you started to have Amish and separate Mennonite schools in my area. Before that, you know, my father and mother went to school with, you know, Amish folks up until the eighth grade when they, you know, then left the school. Was Do you know if there was any of that here in, in Lebanon County? Well, Mike uh, and Dad, you can chime in here if you need to. <clears throat> yeah. We were going to actually take some time, but obviously, you know, we ran a little bit over. We have so much. I, I understand. We're, we're 10 pounds <laughs> in a five pound bag. So. I know. So, so what I've noticed is, um, you know, we, we talk about this often about how the schools that the Amish or Mennonite attend, they really haven't changed. As you saw the collage of pictures, which I can go back there. 
um, real quick and get off the screen to go back to that one. What you'll notice is in the top right, there's an old school that used to be a public school and they repurposed it as Mennonite. Another good example is the Schaeferstown um, High School, which became the Schaeferstown Mennonite High School. So those two cases, obviously this was a lot earlier or a lot later on, but dad, we, we talked about this before. The, what it, the, the yeah, actual can, instructors. Yeah. Tell yeah, me, I, tell me. I can jump that. in. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, yeah. To answer your question, Mike, they still exist today, much the same as they did in the mid 1700s. So throughout Lebanon, Lancaster County, all the way out through the counties of Pennsylvania into Ohio and beyond the Amish and Mennonite have their own schools, and they typically uh, only teach students up to eighth grade, what we would call eighth grade. And the instructors or the teachers are not really certified teachers. They don't go to college like other traditional public schools and parochial schools. Uh, they're basically students that excelled in class and had a desire personally to become a teacher. And uh, they teach them the, the very basic things, much the same as what generations that preceded me and Jared, Jared's the 10th generation in our family. Uh, our ancestors arrived in 1750 and bought the property from William Penn and were settlers in North Lebanon. And uh, they uh, have the same schools pretty much today as they did back then and kind of use the same sort of technology, meaning the blackboard with chalk. And I don't think they're sophisticated enough that they even use slide rules, like I mentioned earlier. But uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's, a, you know, it's more so a focus on the trade and on ethics and very much still uh, in the language of, of German or low German, Pennsylvania Dutch, and uh, driven by, uh, put into the context of, of scripture in the Bible. Um, nothing wrong with it. In fact, most of the Mennonites and Amish as a population has grown today, as you know, in Lancaster and Lebanon, they, they have trades, they have uh, boutique shops of different types to sell their wares and uh, still very much a, a strong core of the communities in South Central PA. Yes, I, I know my parents, you know, talked about that there were different students that they had gone to school with that were, were Amish and, and some of them were, were very, very intelligent and kind of mourn the fact that eighth grade was going to be their last year because they like school, they did well in school, but you know, that wasn't just going to be their life. So uh, that, that I thought was, was always rather interesting. So sure. uh, we did get a, uh, an, a, a question in from uh, Sue Bowman uh, and Sue asked, what impact do you see uh, in the growth of homeschooling having on the public school system? Well, that's a great question. Uh, Very good. <laughs> yeah, I think it will likely grow. Uh, the issue and the struggle I find even within our own family is that typically today, both, uh, both parents work. So the question is, how much time is available on the part of either the father or the mother to spend with the children? I know uh, my daughter and son-in-law struggled with that with their two children. So uh, I think that while technology affords us the opportunity to do homeschooling better than ever before, I think it will still come down to the availability of uh, the parents. Yeah, I, I agree with you there, Michael. I, I think that a lot of parents got a, a kind of uh, more than a crash course during the pandemic when all of a sudden their, st their students were home with them. Yeah. And, you know, this idea of trying to juggle home, life, schooling, and their own work all in the same space, uh, I think that probably gave some people, you know, they got to kick the tires but didn't necessarily want to buy it. Yeah. Uh, and then I think other families, it worked for them. Uh, but, but certainly, uh, it's a lot more to juggle at home. Yes. And I think there's definitely social benefits that everyone has experienced and learned as a result of this uh, homeschooling during the pandemic era. Uh, I, I know there's, it's important for children to grow up together and not just to be around mom and dad or you know, brother and sister at home while they're also being schooled. So 
Uh, I can see it from both sides. It's a great question, and I don't really know the answer. I just have some very basic thoughts about it. Well, I'll, I'll ask both of you. We, we don't have any other open questions right now. Are there any particular school buildings that you say are your favorite within the county? <laughs> wow. That's a great yes. question. Too. I know that I might be first? like picking a favorite child, but you know, I'll, I'll ask the question anyway. Should I, should I go first, Dad? Sure. Okay, so simpler for you. I, I find that some of my favorite buildings are no longer standing. And it's hard to say that because I've never actually seen them in person, but the design, the look of them, I, I can only get in a description from other people. And I feel like any building that was designed by Harvey Hauer is one of my favorites. This one being uh, here is, was Washington. Um, I don't know why it looks sort of like a white house, uh, design. <laughs> it it's independence like hall. Yeah. It is. Right. It, it looks like a white, even though it's a standard, I guess it's like a mixture of colonial and, you know, right. these other styles. It's just, it's beautiful. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, and I, I, I would say it. any of them, you know, in that era, I like a lot of the older school houses, even, even ones like, um, the, I remember going into, uh, not for um, instruction, but the Cornwall school near the furnace here across from the elementary that was later used for storage. We used to go in there and they'd have uh, different things going on in the basement and things. But I like the look of that school. It's, it's a, I ta often talk with Sue Wenzel about this. It's a sh shame that they had to tear that building down uh, when really the land wasn't planned to be used for anything else. So um, that's just another example. I did like the look of that school. And even the older schoolhouses that we mentioned in the first presentation, um, such as Bird Coleman um, and so forth, because that one's still standing. Yes. And now it's really hard to home. say. Yeah, it's really hard to say. I mean, I, well, my I, I, it's hard to pick favorites. What's yours, Matt? My favorite was Lebanon High School, mainly, uh, and which I agree one? with what Jared which, said. Which yeah, one? <laughs> I agree with what Jared was saying about the style and architecture of older buildings. What I liked about them is they had big windows in the classrooms, and the three primary schools that I attended were over 100 years old at Garfield and Lindley Murray and Harding, and, um, you know, they were basically very small type structures in classrooms with the old style desks. Uh, that were joined back to back, back to front. Um, but the Lebanon Senior High School in South 8th Street, the Three Ring Circus, as Jared called it, um, th that was radically different than any other school in its time or prior to that time. And I had the benefit of visiting virtually all the schools in Lebanon during my lifetime. So I got to see them inside and meet with the students. I was privileged to be able to do that. Uh, so from an architectural standpoint, the older ones were really cool because of the style. But Lebanon Senior High School in South 8th Street, the present one, uh, was very, very unique. And it had some very cool amenities. And it was the most modern, technically, of all of the schools in the entire county uh, during my, my time. It certainly is an innovative design. Yeah, very cool. I, the yep. other one was this guy. I really... Wish this would have been standing today. Yeah. Um, the, the archways and everything. It's just, we get a taste of it with Stevens Tower here, but that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Good question. We all, one of our favorite things to do is for someone to send us or give us a photo and says, where is this? Or what is this? <laughs> and to, to, we have to figure it out. Um, and that's, just that's, that's one of my fun. favorite things to do. So if you know Jack Kiscadden does this all the time, he'll send me something and he'll say, "This is where this was," or "Where was this?" or "What, what was the name of this?" That's one of my favorite things to do. No, that oh, is a great exercise to you know to have this old photo and you're like, "I know this has to be somewhere local, but where exactly is this? Where was this standing?" So yeah, right. since since we're both out of state now, it's a little bit harder. But we have a vast collection of maps, ancient maps, I'll call them, and that really helps us to pinpoint the location of schools and churches and businesses and the like. Uh, so we just go down that rabbit hole whenever we're trying to find something 
like Jared said. And then once we find that, we go into newspapers or books, magazines, whatever, uh, to you know, triangulate uh, where this structure might be. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I think the beers and the uh, sandboard maps are probably the most helpful. The atlases and fire insurance maps yeah. as far as pinpointing. Yeah, they are highly detailed. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Well, we, we don't Very have good. any other uh, open questions, so I think we'll, we'll end the talk for this evening. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining this lecture. I especially want to thank Jared and Michael Blauk for their presentation and for Kathy Donaldson for helping to organize our virtual talk. I also want to thank the friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace who sponsored this program. If you or your business would like to sponsor a future lecture, please contact the site for further information. And of course, donations are always gladly accepted. Please join us uh, for our next lecture, which will be Tuesday, June 7th, when Mike Weber will speak about Tropical Storm Agnes. And of course, June of this year will be the 50th anniversary of the storm. So uh, very timely to talk about uh, Tropical Storm Agnes. Uh, and just a reminder, the museum is open Friday through Sunday. And please to check out our website for details and tour information. So I'd just like to say for everyone to, to please stay safe and uh, good night. Thank you, Mike, Kathy. God bless. Yes, thank you.